talk is going to be given by Dr. Jim Long. Uh, Jim is a professor of forest ecology and silviculture in the Queenie College of Natural Resources and Ecology Center here at Utah State. He works on the production ecology of coniferous forests and quantitative silviculture. Much of his work involves development and implementation of strategies to achieve desired future stand conditions for a variety of resource objectives. His last sabbatical was at the University of Turin in Italy. And so I'm happy to welcome Jim and happy to be one of his students. Thank you. Thanks, Art. I guess I am being projected, okay. Um, last sabbatical in Turin, and I, the punchline to that is forestry has been very, very good to me. Uh, we've gotten to go some <clears throat> really great places and, and interact with, with great, great people. Um, I want to provide some context here before I get into the, the, uh, the, <clears throat> the meat of this, uh, this talk. And first of all, I, I want to apologize to Karen because I've completely changed it. And so she doesn't know what I'm going to say. Uh, and and, my, and might, might kind of moonwalk out of the room at some point. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, all of you uh, know quite a bit about Aspen, and um, I'm, I'm speaking right now, right at this moment, to, to the younger, younger people in, in the room. Um, much, of what we, much of what people in this room know uh, is, is really uh, surprisingly recent. Uh, from a, a perspective, I, I got a kick out of, of Mark's uh, talk about the, the the old guys talk, and you know to some extent that may be where where I'm coming from. But um, I my undergraduate degree <coughs> was from the University of Washington uh, back in the late '60s, and you know from that from that over that perspective, I mean things have fundamentally changed with our, our understanding of Aspen. And it's very dynamic. I mean, it, it's, you know, uh, come to this uh, conference next year or, or something similar, and, and there'll be, you know, things that we, we're, we're still, this is all evolving. Um, so I'm gonna, part of what I wanna convey, particularly to the young people, is, is that what you, what in fact you, you know uh, is, uh, we, we didn't know maybe five years ago. Uh, and much of what we know today <laughs> will be, uh, may, may in fact be wrong. Uh, and I, uh, that's humbling for, for me as an educator. I, I worry about that when I get up and, and lecture to, uh, to students now. I, you know, what am I telling them uh, <laughs> that you know, 10 years from now uh, is just, you know, we'll, we'll understand is wrong. So with that, with that context, I'll, I'll uh, proceed. <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice. You've, you've seen a version of this, uh, you know, several times, many times over the last, uh, the last day and a half, uh, little range map. And uh, Populus tremuloides is a, is a truly remarkable species. I mean, a, a, a truly remarkable species in, in many ways. Um, and one of them is its huge geographic range. I mean, it's, it's a truly, truly impressive attribute. And uh, based on my... Based on my European experience, I mean, if you if you combine Trimuloides with uh, with a couple of, of very closely related uh, species in Eurasia, uh, the distribution, the range of of uh, Aspen is global. Um, I mean, it, it it truly is global, and it, it's not only a, a longitudinal <coughs> range, but also latitudinal. Um, our our focus is is what uh, we're, we're referring to as Western, Western Aspen. So it's really the, mostly the interior Western United States is, is where we're, we're gonna be <coughs> speaking to. And it has, has come out, uh, they're, they're, you know, Aspen isn't the same everywhere. <laughs> there, there are differences. So that, that's part of the sort of the backstory to, to uh, our perspective. Um, Aspen is, is ecologically important uh, throughout its range, there, uh, I think it was. I'm pretty sure it was Paul uh, yesterday that that sort of rhetorically asked, uh, "Was aspen a, a keystone or a foundational species?" Well, it's clearly a foundational species for for sure. Um, it it has uh, 
importance in terms of, of biodiversity uh, well out of, of proportion to its, its typical presence at, at both the landscape and the stand level. Um, data, for example, from Aspen mixed conifer stands in Arizona suggesting, I mean, this is just one a case study, uh, you know, less than 20% of the stand basal area, but well over 80% of the, of the cavity nesters dependent on aspirin. So, I mean, that's just one example of, of its, its importance. <coughs> Uh, from, from this sort of interior west perspective that, that I mostly have, um, I, I am uh, truly impressed by the ecological amplitude of, of Aspen. Uh, in the central Rockies, uh, it's uh, of the United States, um, it, it's, it's a component of every vegetation type from tree line or one could argue even below uh, lower tree line. There's a, hopefully you can see that. There's a, an aspen patch there in, a, in kind of a mesic microsite out in the shrub step uh, all the way up to subalpine. Um, remarkable ecological amplitude. What I'm going to focus on, the basic theme for, for me this afternoon, uh, is contrasting <coughs> sort of the, the conventional view, and this is a forester's view. This is the, the view of a silviculture. It's the conventional model that, you know, casting back a, a, a few years, not, a, not even a decade, uh, that, that, that has changed. So if we, if we went in a, you know, in a, a time machine back uh, not, not very many years, um, th this would, you know, this would be the sort of thing, and we've, we've heard, you know, people have, have kind of referred to this. This would be the, the, the conventional view. And, and in some circles, it, it still is. There are elements of this that are, that are still, uh, accepted, having to do with the relative tolerance of the species, its, its regeneration ecology, genetic diversity, or lack of it, um, its role in, in stand dynamics and, and succession. And then finally, um, the punchline for me is how does this view uh, affect um, our, our choice of our, the way that we build silvicultural systems? And, and they strongly, strongly uh, influence, influence that. Relative tolerance, it's, it's generally accepted. Uh, and, I, and I'm not questioning this, but I think that uh, it, it needs to be nuanced. But uh, it's, it's very intolerant. Baker, in his, his classic um, uh, seminal uh, Principles of Silviculture text in, the, in 1950, uh, characterized Aspen as very intolerant. He had no, he had no category below that in terms of, of of uh, relative tolerance. And Baker um, knew Aspen. I mean, he worked with Aspen starting in the 20s. He, he worked in Utah, for example, as a, as a consultant uh, working, working with Aspen. So he, you know, he had observed it firsthand. Um, he, he talked to people that, that also that worked with Aspen, and he characterized it as exceedingly tolerant. That's, that's, a, a, that's certainly part of our conventional wisdom. Uh, another part of that is that it, uh, aspen is dependent on periodic um, high severity disturbance. Now, uh, under a, a natural fire regime, that would be a, a stand replacing stand replacing fire, at least in our part of the world, you know, Utah, Central Rockies, um, <clears throat> might be a it might be clear felling, um, but uh, periodic high severity disturbance. And in the absence of that periodic high severity disturbance, uh, you're going to lose aspen. Okay, that's the, you know, the conventional wisdom. This image on the right is one I took in the book cliffs, and it was one that, I, I mean, I spent a fair amount of time staring at this tree when I, when I came across it. Uh, I mean, a very, very rare example. I thought I'd maybe be the first one that had ever seen anything like this. You know, an aspen that had survived a non-lethal understory fire uh, and, and, in fact, developed a, a fire scar. Uh, don't see that kind of thing, and that's not, you know, that's not part of our image of, of aspen. It's so thin barked, you know, if you get a fire, it's going to be, it's going to be high severity. Um, another part of the, I mean, certainly our understanding, our conventional understanding of, of uh, western aspen uh, is that it's all about the suckers. Um, <clears throat> you know, seedling, uh, sexual reproduction is, is not only rare, it's vanishingly rare. It's of, of no, uh, you know, no certainly no practical ecological or, or silvicultural importance. All about, all about suckers. Um, a consequence of, of, of those things 
uh, is that that typically, and I'm I'm you know I'm I'm playing a little fast and loose with with my version of conventional wisdom because clearly it's long been recognized in our part of the world. Uh, you know, people talk about on some marginal sites and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, bear bear with me on this for the for the sake of the story. Uh, certainly, the the typical situation would would be that high severity disturbance and abundance of of natural regeneration from those suckers, uh, and and what develops are are uh, pretty simple stands. Pretty simple stands. They may be uh, nearly pure or actually pure uh, aspen and and a single single cohort. Um, <clears throat> clonality. Um, you know, a, a big part of the, the conventional wisdom uh, is that silviculturists could recognize, I mean, stands equal clones, clones equal stands. I mean, not with that, with, you know, again, with, you know, we could, we could nuance it a little bit, but that was the, that was the story. And, uh, you know, a, a silviculturist, me, you know, a few years ago, looking at, at a, a landscape like this, you know, I could pick out, with certainty, I could pick out the clones. You know, there were five or six. We could quibble. You know, we could quibble about that, but that's that's a clone, that's a clone, and so on. Um, I, I'll I'll tell a story. Well, she tells it on herself. Karen, uh, when I, I think she may have gotten her initial view of of aspen clonality from me, or, or people <laughs> likened to me, and and she got real excited about this situation because she saw this as a as, as a natural common garden. So if in fact uh, this was, you know, this was a clone, and this was a clone, and a fairly uniform site, fairly uniform site here, uh, that you could, you, you could, without the expense of actually establishing a common garden from scratch, uh, you know, there was this opportunity for some some real effective study of gene expression. Um, on, so anyway, that was was something that uh, she got really excited about, it and her hopes were dashed. Um, <clears throat> The, you know, all of those things, not necessarily in, in order, uh, but they sort of uh, clearly influenced our uh, silvicultural view of appropriate silvicultural systems. Um, and, and it was really simple coppice. You know, clear fell and, and, you know, regenerate and let the good times roll. You know, if, you, if you're a regeneration forester and you believe in reincarnation, you're going to come back and you know, <laughs> manage, manage Aspen. That's the closest thing to a sure thing that we have in our semi-arid environment in terms of regenerating it. Um, and simple stand structures. So these were, you know, this, this silvicultural system was simple coppice with you know, growing an even age stand, pretty much pure. Uh, and genetic diversity was really not something that silviculturists needed to worry about. It was very limited. I mean, with other, uh, in, in high forest systems, with conifers, for example, Silviculturists, I mean, we're trained to worry about what we're doing, uh, the, the kind of treatments that we do, how that's, how that's affecting uh, the genetic diversity of the stand. You know, woe be unto the silviculturist that practices dysgenic selection. Uh, well, with, with aspen, we didn't, you know, it just wasn't a concern. It wasn't a concern. Um, <clears throat> Not that there weren't issues that were uh, people were aware of. I mean, conifer encroachment, uh, <clears throat> stands that were in decline, where the overstory was dying without natural, re, you know, natural regeneration, um, and this, you know, th I, I put this up here to kind of make fun of myself. Um, I, I this was published not. I mean, a little less than 20 years ago. I mean, I, you know, I stated with great certainty, like a lot of other people. Uh, but you know, my mother had an expression that she used on my brothers and I with some regularity: "Is just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's right." Uh, and, and my only defense would be that, well, a lot of other people believe that believe that as well. Um, I, uh, I I maybe should have changed that photo credit to Smith. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I mean, you, you've heard you've heard this story. You, you've, and I, this is part of the, the the liberty that I've taken with the story. Uh, Karen would argue that, uh, you know, our our discovery of 
I, I put the, the sexual reproduction before the genetic diversity in telling this story, and she thinks that, well, it actually happened the other way around. We found all this genetic, she and her colleagues found all this genetic diversity, and then they started looking for the seedlings, and, and lo and behold, they found them. Um, a big part, a big part of the apparent absence of sexual reproduction, I believe, was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, we, we thought that it was rare, uh, therefore, the, 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 the standard of proof for a seedling versus a, a sucker uh, was, was almost impossibly high. I mean, if you found a, 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 a young aspen growing out in the middle of a phosphate mine or something, you know, then maybe it was a seedling and, and so on. But uh, I think there was, a, there was certainly an element of that. I wanted to point out, this is another one of, of Mary Lou's photos, but the, you know, the Jack's drawing, and you've heard something about that. Um, when Baker was studying Aspen in Utah back in the 20s, uh, he was concerned about ungulate browsing pressure. Um, interestingly enough, um, in contrast to Mary Lou's situation, and in, uh, perhaps in, in uh, Justin's situation in, in the <coughs> down in Cedar Mountain, Baker was concerned about domestic livestock, and he didn't even Ask, uh, elk were not even on his radar. Uh, he didn't even mention them as, as an issue. Uh, elk populations were, were very low and, and not, a, not a factor. Our, under, our change in our understanding of clonality, uh, this is Swan Flat, uh, one of Karen's initial study sites. Um, and you know, in, in, the, in the old days, four or five years ago, uh, we would, you know, the, the the, cl the clearly delineated stands, and the assumption was that they were that they represented clones. Uh, and in fact, when when the when they folks started looking at that, um, we're going to zero in on that particular stand. Uh, and in fact, there, instead of representing a single a single clone, there are 24 of them. Uh, half of them are are represented by a single ramet, a single stem. So the Karen's referred to those as onesies. Uh, a great deal of genetic diversity uh, in, in there. Uh, overall, in that Swan Flat area, you know, approaching 200, 200 clones in a, in a relatively, uh, you know, not a, not a big area. Um, and, uh, you know, over a third of those being, uh, again, the onesies. Great deal of genetic diversity. We had no, I, no idea. Uh, and it's not just about um, that there are a lot more clones than we appreciated. Karen's going to, I won't speak to this, uh, Karen's going to talk about triploidy, but uh, that's something that, you know, people, geneticists forever, have known that Aspen produced, occasionally produced triploids. Until very recently, uh, there was absolutely no appreciation for, for in, in fact, how important that is. Uh, and it's important not only ecologically, but I think in terms of future management. There's some preliminary uh, information to suggest that, that triploids, in fact, uh, outperform, at least early in a rotation, uh, outperform substantially diploids. So, uh, you know, th there may be some real opportunity there. This is the Pando clone and the same, same kind of, same kind of, of, uh, of story. And I, I, I think in, in terms of, of I'm going to get to the, to the silviculture here in a second, but I, I think as you, as you read that, I think this is an example of, of ecologically important intrastand uh, genetic diversity that, that as we, as, you know, we, we can apply, we can apply this on, on several different fronts. Another element of our changing view, the conventional view of Western Aspen, is multiple, <coughs> multiple pathways of stand development. This is, the, this is certainly the conventional view, and it's a model that works many, many places uh, over and over again, but it's not the only one. Uh, Aspen, in spite of its relative tolerance, in fact, is able to make it in lots of different kinds of stand structures. Uh, and that's, that's important. That's the sort of thing that everybody sees uh, certainly I did, but didn't really, wasn't forced until recently to, to say, well, what does that mean? The fact that you see, you know, these mixed conifer aspen stands. Um, 
Paul talked about uh, different, uh, different approaches on, on how that, that might be kind of quantified, formalized. Um, <coughs> silviculture certainly need to broaden our view. You know, multiple pathways of stand development. Uh, I, this has implications. Uh, you know, we need to broaden our view of restoration. Uh, and, and there are real challenges for appropriate uh, reference models for, for restoration. Um, and I'm convinced uh, that we have, silviculturists have a lot more to work with in our, in our toolkit besides simple coppice. Aspen is, in fact, a remarkable species with a great deal of plasticity and I think can, can be made a part of, of mixed aged, mixed conifer stands, even on very good sites. Um, I think this is an example of a, of a late frost here we had in northern Utah a few years ago. Um, had a, a real, you know, real visual impact here. Um, for, for a long time, you know, 100 years, foresters have dealt with, uh, with uh, seed maps and, and trans seed transfer guidelines. Uh, as we start to think about Aspen uh, in, in you know, assist, assisted migration, um, I think we, we, need to, we need to be thinking about applying that to, to Aspen. The Canadians have, have are, are ahead of us uh, on that at this point. Um, to kind of summarize where, where I think we, we, we are at this point, you know, fast forward from five years ago, you know, seeding events are, are uh, actually fairly common. Uh, and I'm, my, my gut feeling at this point is that they're very common. Uh, not just fairly, fairly common. Um, and within stand, genetic diversity is, is both ecologically and silviculturally relevant. It's not moot. We've got to be concerned about it. Um, and the ecological roles, like stand dynamics and succession, uh, are varied and not restricted to, to one or, or two conventional, conventional models. And there, in fact, is, in my view, uh, a, a very uh, broad range of silvicultural alternatives which can and, and I believe should be, should be considered. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Okay, if anybody has any. Karen's back there shaking her fist at me. So I, I also have the same sense as you that uh, establishment for seed is actually much more common than we thought over the years. And but my question to you is how can we work with that in the field? So a year after, two years after the seed is established, then it's fine. But then eventually, how can we approach that methodologically in the field? Uh, I, no, that's that's you know, and and I think. I think maybe Mary Lou was asked the question about, you know, are they, are they going to get overwhelmed by, by suckers? I mean, which probably have an inherent competitive advantage if they get the same start and that, you know, that kind of thing. I, I mean, I think from a practical standpoint at, at, at this, you know, at this stage, uh, I would be fairly comfortable suggesting things like, well, if you have a, a, a large natural disturbance, uh, or even even a, 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 a situation where you are uh, maybe have have you know done a, a you know a clear cut or something um, that you where you you don't expect suckering because there there really wasn't and and you're getting aspen I think maybe you might go to heroic links to protect it uh, just in terms of the the genetic diversity. I mean, trying to you know kind of cherish that, I, and and you know if you have a limited fencing budget, maybe that's where it ought to be. I mean, that kind of that that's one that's one thought. Maybe not real satisfying, but in your uh, rethinking about the paradigms related to Aspen, would you uh, see the potential for and the fact that your your fire start Aspen tree? Um, uh, that there may have historically been a role for aspen in high frequency fire situations. High to moderate. Yes. Yeah. I think it, it's, uh, and I think it would be sort of an escape in space and time. I mean, as, as I'm thinking about it, you know, if I have a, 
uh, kind of a dry site, high frequency, maybe a ponderosa pine uh, system uh, that has an aspen component. I think everybody's seen that. Uh, so how do those guys, how do, they, how do they survive? And I think, you know, when you start looking at that, I mean, in the past, I would have looked at it and just sort of dismissed it because it wasn't part of my, you know, part of my model for that system. And I think, you know, I, I guess the first step would be to say, well, how do they, how do they make it in that system? You know, it is it, is it the spatial heterogeneity of the fire, you know, and they have, I, I don't know. My, my example of the fire scarred tree, I mean, they can do it. Uh, how often, I, I don't know. But. Thank you very much. <laughs>